Hello, everybody. Um, we are here um, with the panel today. Um, and our topic is uh, fear of dogs, um, which we one of our favorite topics. Uh, it's going to be sort of a thread that runs through this. We're going to be talking about robot dogs today. And I am joined, as always, by intrepid Academy staffer Christy Benson, uh, Emily Priestley, and Lisa Skivinsky. Um, and uh, so let's see, let's, I just want to introduce this. So what do we mean and what do we not mean? For the record, if a dog is anxious, worried, afraid, that needs to be treated. We're not talking about dogs who are fearful or anxious. What we're talking about uh, is dogs moving and being excited uh, and doing what they want to do. They want to sniff, they want to run around, they want to do zoomies, they want to meet dogs, etc. when they want to do it. Um, and that being a problem. We're also not talking about dogs doing things that endanger the public safety um, or allowing all nuisance behaviors or, or saying that we shouldn't distraction proof dogs just before we came on here. Um, Lisa was talking about, hang on a second, you know, of course we want to distraction proof dogs for certain contexts, walking past the cafe, et cetera, um, that the dog, you know, teach them a watch, et cetera. Um, what we are talking about is that dogs move, dogs are excited, uh, but we have this collision now. In the old days, it used to be fine. It used to be uh, dog training was entirely about control, control, control. A good dog was a dog under control, um, which meant usually less movement, the dog not engaging with its environment, the dog not, um, you know, uh, failing to do obedience, et cetera. Um, and that was fine in the old days. Now things have, have changed. And Zazie Todd put out a book um, a few years ago. It's called WAG, The Science of Making Your Dog Happy. And for me, that kind of is a sort of a, a critical point in, in our thinking where dog training has moved from control the dog, control the dog to, okay, so how can we live successfully with the dog and keep the dog happy. What is the dog really? We want the dog to be fulfilled. We want them to feel safe. We want them to have um, enriched lives. And then along came sort of this idea of agency, which most people in modern dog training agree that the dog should have agency. They should, you know, right down to sort of like, do we don't even want to start training the dog, even though he's sitting there looking at us when we have treats in our hands, we want to have like start button behaviors and stuff because we want to make sure the dog is buying into the training. But the same people in many cases who are touting this idea of agency are also worried, seem to be um, worried about dogs moving and being excited. Um, and so we have this problem, this collision of agency stops us from exerting this strong control. So what does a trainer do if they're upset by movement and excitement, but they buy into agency? And I think what sort of popped out of that grinder is that we teach dogs to be calm for the dog's own good, that it's somehow better and better for and healthier for dogs to be relaxed and to be calm, because if they're not, something is wrong. And remember, we're not talking about fear and anxiety. We're just talking about dogs movement. Um, and so I think teaching calm, Lisa was saying, is an easy sell for owners because that's what they want. And they're sometimes overwhelmed by their dog's behaviors and they don't know what, and they feel they're gonna be judged by us. And it's an easy sell for those trainers who in their heart of hearts, in spite of the agency thing, are control freaks at heart. Um, so, Lisa, talk about, you were talking about sort of some of the stuff that, that, you know, people want in puppy classes or that trainers are want or, 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 or uh, um, and how this sort of collides with, you know, dogs basically doing what they would like to do when they want to do it. Right. Expectations, I think, um, are, are a little bit skewed. And I, I sometimes wonder if it's TikTok and it's YouTube, but it's also, I see dog trainers talking about it. And like you said, I think it's a very easy sell for owners, let's face it, puppies and juvenile dogs, especially. Um, and of course, Emily, who works with so many working breeds, like the cattle dogs and such. Um, there's lots of stuff that it, it making sure that we have dogs that are not, um, let's back, back, back step a little bit here. There's lots of behaviors we'd like to train our dogs not to do or to do different behaviors because they're inconvenient for us. Um, right. And that's fine. That's fine. That's what we want to do. Like you were saying, when I walk Tucker past a cafe outside, I do want him to do a with me and stay right against me as we pass all the tables with bacon on them. Um, but the default position for our walk need not to be, I'm right here staring at you the whole time. I want him to sniff. I want him to explore the world. I want him to see the world. And these expectations, and I think Christy said it best, that the default position is calm and focused, that that's the way the animal must always be until we that's better do something else. 
whereas it's not normal, it's not a realistic expectation for, for these you know, normally functioning organisms to have interests of their own and want to explore things and want to move and do the things that are normal for that species. That instead, we, you know, the way that folks like us view training is to train skills we can use when we need them, when we do need the dog to focus, when we do need the dog to, to do this instead, and then to proof those things against distractions. But what we're seeing out there and what expectations from the clients seem to be developing into is the default position is calm and focused until we give you permission to do an activity that we deem acceptable, not, not what you wanna do, but what we think we're okay with that isn't going to inconvenience us or be a nuisance to us. And it's a really bad jumping off point when you've got people getting dogs and, you know, your goal for them and their dog is that they have a happy, healthy, safe life, that the dog is enriched doing the things that are normal for that species and that the owner gets to enjoy their dogs. Um, and I think that's not, I think that's at odds with this narrative that dogs must, you know, we've got people teaching puppy classes where the entire focus is on mat work where they lay down and watch us for every little thing. Um, you walk past people and dogs without noticing them, only focusing on me. It's just so eye off the ball for what we need to be doing. And it's not fair to the pet dogs who, and it's, it goes completely against the concept of actually having agency. So. So that's you can't say, I mean, it, look, it seems to me, and I, I keep hitting this again and again, that we, we can't say control, control, control. Um, and we can't say distraction proofing anymore. Now we have to say it's engagement and calm, but it's driven by the same trainer need, which is, you know, I, I can't stand that this thing is moving. I can't stand that this thing is not looking at me. Or is it, yeah. it, it, it it's, I don't think it's that simple, but in many yeah, cases too, it's like putting the cart before the horse. Like, you know, we, we all want dogs to at some point have naps and go to sleep and things like that. But in so many cases, I see people, trainers, um, and Horsing. clients, <laughs> the first thing that they want is before they even look at like exercise and enrichment is, you know, do they, do they have this off switch? Can they go and can they relax? Do they know that we don't, you know, not to expect things all the time. And I just think it's like stacking a deck against you. If you have a dog who wants to go and run and sniff and explore and play today, but your first priority is making sure that they will just relax and stay in this like tightly kept little package, you are making it much more difficult in the way of training. Like, why can't we first it's self defeating? Like, it's self defeating it, to, to sort of lead with the calm. So, yeah. you know, it's two, so there's two things. One is why is it better? Why is calm better? why um and the second thing is okay if, if, okay so if you want that how you're achieving it is in a self-defeating manner <laughs> well there's two things i think one like we talked about earlier i think people do get an, a, a misunderstanding about what dogs we have and so they think people often will apologize to me like i'm so sorry my dog is barking you know while we're on a consult i'm so sorry my dogs rush out of the door they jump on people like oh you must be you must think i'm such a bad owner because my dog you know plays rough with me and i think it comes from this expectation that we all have obedience dogs and you know, again, we don't all have dogs that run cool. like wild, like my dogs aren't feral, but they certainly are able to run, play, bark. They do go out of the door before me very quickly. You know, I stand back when I open the door in the morning, things like that. So I think there is this, um, the, a misconception maybe on one hand. And then I do think that there's also a lot of unmet needs. So people are also coming into it they do maybe have dogs who are really excitable. Maybe it's hard to sit down and do some work. And so there is this desire to have dogs that relax, but again, which way are we coming at that? And do we have to go right into like having a dog who just learns that they should never expect anything fun and exciting, or can we provide them with the exercise and the enrichment first and then see where we're at? So I think like, again, I think it's like, you know, it's like trying to like, put that lid on a boiling pot of water on the stove and expecting that, that it's not going to boil over, turn the heat down first. Like it's the, I think we're just coming. It's, the, it's those conflicting paradigms of Pandora's box. If you let it happen, you're going to get more of it. More begets more versus hydraulic model, which is dog has needs. If the needs are met, 
you know, um, and I think there's a lot of people who buy into the, you know, that I don't think they they think about it or they see it that way, but they're buying kind of into the Pandora's box model. Let's talk about teaching off switches. Like Let's. what what is that? And why, why, why can't the dog turn off when he's ready? Why do we have to teach the dog to turn off? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this off switch concept is something I hear a lot working with. It's kind something of selling that we talk about with border collies a lot. Like, you know, do they have a natural off switch and things like that? You know, or are we going to a ranch and buying a working line dog and bringing it home and expecting it to just like off switch all of the time? Like, it's again, I think it's very flashy. It's very like I would love to just have border collies that just have this natural off switch, but I also I, like you know, for my dogs, these are dogs who are bred for very intense exercise. They think a lot. They are, they're bred to, you know, maybe not go all day, but certainly be ready to go if needed and go to work. Um, and so this- Never known a border collie who had plenty of exercise enrichment and fly ball and agility and fetch and, and so on, who didn't turn off when, yeah. when the environment cued that these things are not imminent. Yeah. No, I, and I use the term, like I, I go to border collies a lot because I work with so many of them and so many people that want an off switch. But like Lisa was talking about, we see this with puppies. We see this with labs. We see this with like all sorts of, you know, it's not, I guess it's a term that I, I think often comes from like the, the working or herding group dogs. We want them to have this, like, you know, we want them to go to work when we go to work, but then we also want them to just sleep when it suits us. Um, but it's not something I think that is, is, unique to just I think I think there's a lot there's a movement out there of people that just it would be easier for me if my dog just slept than to have to take it out and do the thing right it's like um and it's a nice sell from a training point of view as well that I can just train your dog to go to sleep naturally all of the time and then it's just whenever you're going to do the exercise and enrichment do it um, but it's not, I don't think extra. like Lisa was saying, yeah, it's not just, you need to get dogs. what about agency? I mean, you know, it, it, it seems to me like it's hard to hold those two things in your mind at the same time. Um, you know, that the dog has agency, but we want the dog to turn on and off when we want, when, when the dog is on, when we don't want it. No, there's no harm to the public safety. The dog's not anxious or afraid. So where's the agency if if now I want you to stop moving? And I think too, like we, as dog trainers, it, it's not good practice to spend a bunch of our clients' time and money training a dog to do something that doesn't really exist, like a calm down stay that's gonna all of a sudden mean that they don't have to meet their dog's needs. Instead, we, like, I think it behooves us as professionals to be like, actually your dog is an adult organism with needs of their own. And I'm gonna take this next, X amount of time with you to talk about how you in your busy life can meet your dog's needs rather than offering up this and nor and know, normal normalize the young dog moves yeah yeah and i mean obviously if we're talking puppies we should be talking socialization i i I, mean, I know we all agree on that so i'm kind of like just taking that as a given but he, he, like you go into an, a, a home <clears throat> with an adult dog and they want calm saying i'm going to teach your dog a calming downstay when you could be saying how can we get this dog's needs met I, I think that that's not okay for the dog. It's the, it's not, it's not yeah, okay the, the whole the objective, the objective is, is a fraught one. So you're raising sort of, you know, the, the thing, and it's something that we talked about whether we should raise it or not. And that is um, relaxation protocols. Um, and I've seen them, it used to be, you know, when they first came up, we were all head scratching. How is this not just a downstay? And then now the relaxation protocol, people start saying, no, 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 it's not a downstay. But then, okay, so what is it and how do you train it? And why are we training it? And, if there's no anxiety or fear, uh, um, why is calm better? And then what are we reinforcing? Like, where's the training plan? And I, I, you know, it's all very fuzzy, um, but everybody agrees that it's shiny and good. And I want to, so why is it good? And how do you train it? You train it by training like a, an extended downstay. A downstay. Yeah. Yeah. How's it, how's it not a downstay? They keep, they're, they're very quick to point out that it's not a downstay, but then it looks like when they act, when you operationalize it and you look at it, they're rewarding a downstay. With using Not like ambient household. Yeah. Like, like it doesn't infer relaxation. And I think Christy, um, cause we've talked about this prior and Christy had a really good point that, you know, the dog 
it does seem like it's doing something when you're teaching the dog a down stay and rewarding it and you're working with them because it's enriching for the dog. Yeah. Yeah. So, which is better than not training. Yeah, Cause you know, right. it, it is, it's, it's a puzzle and all that stuff. Then afterwards you just have this dog that's just laying there during the training process. And you know, dogs love training when you're doing it right you know <laughs> so obviously they're going to be like we this is fun you know during the actual training process but training the trick training a training a sit pretty or a spin would be bad but training a down stays good yeah, yeah. <laughs> from the dog's perspective you know they're like this is fun this is tricks right yeah yeah but at the end and then i think there's like, this expectation you're gonna have so a yeah so if people dog. want to train a down stay i'm all for it i mean i think it's a very <laughs> useful it's a useful it's a very behavior. useful skill yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we can get yeah, to there faster awesome. but yeah you I can did. also give your clients like downstay plans to run on their own time. Like their, the relaxation protocols are readily available online and people can go and just 10 minutes a day. If they want to train that downstay, they can do it. I don't think we have to be as practitioners, like selling it as a relaxation um, piece that we have to train. Like it's a, it's pretty, actually pretty straightforward to train a downstay using ambient household movements and sounds and things like that. Um, and it go to your mat. So that, you know, yeah, you can yeah. yeah and proof and proof it for, you know, guests over and hors d'oeuvres or, or what have you. But at least you were talking before about sort of when, when does sort of distraction proofing a downstate become sort of this, you were, um, I want to, you said it's egregious cruelty um, to oh, proof downstays see, in places where. Like, yeah, you'll see YouTube videos, you'll see these trainers, they put these dogs out in like cow pastures, bizarre dog places. parks. Yeah. And, oh, the worst. That's the, you know, they're locally here. There's some um, really dangerous trainers. They bring the dog to the dog park on leash with a shock collar into the dog park. And should the dog try to interact with another dog, step away, even one step from the trainer, they get shocked. Um, and they're proud of this. They're yeah. proud of the, the pr control, control, oh, yeah. control, control. So basically they're proofing the dog's strictest obedience in, in, in a, in a location in an environment in a situation that is specifically set up for dogs to play with one another. So all of the other dogs are playing and running and wrestling and fetching. And you bring this poor dog. And a lot of the time they're really young, like five month olds and they bring them in and they've got them on a shock and they've got them on a prong and God forbid the dog moves away, takes a step away, tries to interact with another dog, they get corrected, they get punished. How is that not animal cruelty? It is absolutely cruelty. Um, and it upsets so many of my clients with the, um, another trainer that goes to, well, we have a canal path along the Erie Canal here in Rochester. Um, and they will stand and they'll put the, the young dogs, they'll, they'll have them sit right next to them with a shot collar on, right with their toes up against the canal trail. And the canal trail is not terribly wide, maybe three to four feet wide. And when and people walk their dogs and ride their bikes and all of that. And when another dog starts running to them, if they step out, and these are five month old, six month, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? If they step toward the dog, immediately, immediately get checked. Literally setting the dog up to be a dog. And then when they are a dog, they get electrocuted for it. It's absolutely egregious. Mm -hmm. um, it's very tough. And and if, I think a lot of like the people on the good guy side agree that that's that's of course. Hilarious, you know. But they still want, want the dog in the house to be calm. Yeah, you know, not just is, in the house, outside as well. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. Really sort of, they wouldn't you know, I mean, I don't, I mean, I'm not saying right. these things are equivalent, um, but there's there is there's some overlap in the Venn diagram there of yeah. of wanting the dog to, to do what I want him to do rather than what he wants to do. Um, you know, uh, uh, yeah. And it plays very much into the, the dog owning publics. You know, we still have myths that I regularly need to, um, bust about, you know, a dog's eagerness to please. So you have oh. these, these owners who already oh. think, why is my dog not listening to me? Mm. You know, why aren't they coming away from coming to me when I call them away from other dogs at the dog park when they haven't yet done a recall? Um, why doesn't my dog want to please me? And this idea that dogs 
behavior is to please their humans is not only is it a false narrative, not only is it not true, but boy, does it set dogs up to be punished constantly. So they're always being jerked at and yelled at and, um, you know, squished down. How many times do you see people trying to shove their dog into a sit and make them stay in an exciting environment? Um, and if they, you know, if they don't do it on their own, why does it, there's something wrong with this dog? And then Emily, working with the dogs that you do that were trained to work um, both with handlers and independently. And, you know, there are dogs that, that some trainers would call aloof because they're not like, you know, oh, play with me, play with me to the person. And then those dogs are branded, what, stubborn? Um, oh, yeah. You know, because they're not eager enough to please and aren't dogs supposed to be eager? I had a dime for every um, chow client who said their dog has been labeled hard-headed uh, or um, sort of, uh, uh, you know, sort of dumb or, you know, uh, uh, sort of just uneager to please by a previous trainer, I'd be a millionaire, you know? And then the people just, of course, a, a trainer says it. So, okay. You know, and, and, you know, like, wow, why can't the dog, you know, why can't the dog be their own personality? Yeah. yeah. And talk about stacking the deck against yourself. Like we go out, we get these, you know, cattle dogs that are bred to do this without input often from a handler and to like react, you know, be feisty, be independent, all of these things. We get Malinois, we get border collies, we get, you know, these days here, there's so many like livestock guardian breeds or livestock guardian breeds mixed with things like Malinois and border collies <laughs> and all of the stuff like head scratching. Moment. You know, it, it really, and, and we do, we talk about this a lot. Like I, my first dog was a border collie pit bull cross. I had no idea what I was doing. Right. I went to the shelter, brought this dog home. It was a learning curve for sure. But there's also like, we, I really recommend just, if you're going to get a dog, make sure if calm and like relaxation, you know, not having to be physical, not going for walks, not doing, you can't training, bear, not if doing you exercise, can't bear not movement. doing enrichment. Yeah, do don't know, if you can't that. tolerate if if you can't tolerate movement, there's a be there, careful. There's like, a huge variety of breeds to choose from, you know, or, or types if we to selectively from, or ages. breed something. Adopt senior, you know, adopt a senior. Go to Muttville and adopt a senior dog, you know. Uh, um, yes. it, and there's it's, lots of like get an adult well, dog. Go if, to the and shelter. And if you're in, and if you really believe in agency, put your money where your mouth is. You know, what if the dog doesn't want to be calm right now? Right. Right. <laughs> I mean, cause you, you know, I'm telling you, I get these field line labs in here and, and it's not, and I'm not judging clients. I'm not judging no. dog guardians because it is hard to have a puppy. It's, pr it's pros aiding. It's pros who are abate, aiding and abetting this and driving the narrative. Right. I think what's, so it's funny. So for so many trainers, they're pushing the narrative. Um, and so many people are pushing the narrative of calm and focused. And owners and eat it, it up. 10 times harder for me to do the job that was already challenging of normalizing normal dog behavior. <laughs> dogs that get excited, dogs that want to play, dogs that bark when they, the mailman comes. These are normal things and normalizing predation, play, um, any number of things that are normal for a, a you know, a species that is- Talk about puppy classes. Lisa, talk, talk to me about the, uh, you know, the, the idea of using the limited time that we have puppies in class and using that time to distraction proof or teach calm yeah. as opposed to other agenda items. I, it, it's to me, it's alarming. You've got this, we, as we all know, we've got this tiny window of time to get them really comfortable about things like body handling and do soft mouth training and socialization with people, with dogs, with kids, with everything in the world. It's a one hour window I have with them for five or six weeks, one hour a week. And the idea that I would spend that valuable class time having them do settle on a mat and focus we teach a downstay, by the way. It's part of our curriculum. Yeah. Very much as a downstay. And we give ways to proof it at home. And we give ways to use it in real life contexts that are going to be helpful when you need it. But the idea that we would spend time, you know, having them walk past other dogs and people without paying attention, having them lay on a mat to do settle, settle. You can teach that any time. hour to play, to interact, to, to experience, learn those heavy and socialization um, skills. And the idea that I would take that time from them, it's not enough time already. And it kind of plays into some of what we talked about before. We have, those of us who um, do try to meet the needs of our dogs and put a lot of time and effort into it. And of course, for some of us, you know, I've got a 
Frenchie with a heart condition and two senior pit bulls. They're easier to meet the net <laughs> needs of in some ways than say a cattle dog or a border collie. But it's hard enough for us to meet the needs of our dogs for things like whether it's puppies and puppy class, making sure they're getting adequate socialization time, adequate play sessions, adequate body handling. Um, things and, that are actually time, things that are actually time sensitive. Time sensitive. Once the window closes, it's like pushing an elephant up a hill to change fear, to change discomfort. To I love when people say, "Hey, we didn't do puppy class. We, you know, we missed, we missed socializing. So I want to socialize my two and a half year." Yeah. <laughs> like, okay. I'm not, our classroom is not the place to, to socialize your two and a half year old course. So, <laughs> but <laughs> people don't get it. We need to do that stuff in puppy mm. class. But and they've general, been so woefully misinformed. How is it that we're in 2023 and the general public, you know, many have, um, you know, uh, that there are still people out there where dog training, where we have failed as a profession to get through the message of what is time sensitive, what is not. <laughs> early you have to start and how important it is and what the ramification is of failing to adequately socialize dogs. How is it that we've muddled that message um, and, 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 and allowed to encroach in to the pet dog world, these ideas from the sports world that it somehow um, fails to create this asocial dog who doesn't want to socialize because that prevent that you know, presents a more convenient dog to train for dog sports and that somehow that should be the goal in pet dog training. You know, how, how, you know, and how have we sort of failed there, you know, and then we're, you know, oh, we should te be teaching puppies to be calm. And, it, you know, it's you know, not only fear of dogs, it's almost like fear of puppies. Like how, you know, how can, you know, who can be afraid of puppy play? Yeah. And I think I, there's I, like when the Snafari movement kind of first got going, it was so awesome and exciting, right? Yeah. So like, all of a sudden. Move out. We should have move Ari. Yeah. Well, like dogs are allowed <laughs> to sniff on walks. Dogs don't, the whole idea that dogs should be focusing on their humans with their oriented with their eyes and their faces and all of their like sensory uh, apparatus on us as humans to me is like creepy and weird all it this is creepy you know but so I was like yay this thing is happening the sniffaris we're going to get dogs who are allowed to sniff on walks and allowing the dog to sort of set the pace of the walk and all this is great and very agent and that's very agency that was very of, agency. it's aligned with yeah. agency yeah yeah but I think there's a little bit of encroachment of the whole well it, Snafaris are better than, you know, that that's a better way to enrich your dog or to meet their needs than to like allow them to play or chew or fetch or something. And I'm like, can't it be both? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah because what if a dog prefers the movement part? You know, I mean, yeah. you know. I do see a lot of people actually who sniffaris are wonderful, but I see a lot of people that are like, my dog gets a topple for breakfast. We do a sniffari. You know, but he's not settling. Why won't he settle? And I like the sniffaris, but at the same time, like, you know, if I took my dogs out for sniffaris and that was it, even if it was like an hour, it's not. Just not, not yeah, for Brian, that would be perfect. I mean, he lives yeah. to sniff, but I've yeah. also had dogs who live to fetch. You know, yes. so what? You know, so and you know, if if everybody sort of thought about what they live for. And if their spouse said, you know what, I, I kind of don't like that. So I'm, you know, you're not going to get that because I want you to be calm. You know, you're going to do something else. You know, like you're imposing your kids saying, no, I know your interest is, you know, is blah, but you know what? No, I'd prefer your interest to be this other thing. It, you know, wow. It's creeping into subservience territory. And I think it we, can't, is. we can't talk yeah. about subservience yeah. anymore. Because no, so it has to be for the dog's own good. Yeah. But, but I mean, like dressing it up. Framed that way. Dress but it's still subservience to our desires and needs doesn't make it better. Yeah, our comfort level. Listen, there's plenty of parents that don't want their kids wall climbing. It can be, you know, they're way up there. What if they get hurt? But what if the well, kids want- wear little harnesses and ropes and stuff? They do, they do. <laughs> the idea is that like, I get that it may make us uncomfortable when our dog- Yeah, does. but there's a trade-off of disallowing. I mean, we talked about this, we were talking about fetch and we got into the whole sort of, oh my God, what if the dog blows a cruise ship? You know, um, and, and right. this whole sort of, the, you know, the whole trade-off thing about movement that, yeah, you know, uh, I, you know, I, I it, you know, clearly we're kind of, we're, we feel very sort of done with this, but we have to recognize that we're still pushing this boulder up the hill. Um, and how do we, so how do we change hearts and minds of trainers who find it upsetting when dogs move? Well, you know, what do we do there? I think we keep doing, you know, as many uh, social media posts, you know, the folks that make really- Normalize, yeah, normalize. Yeah. 
Ah. And, and keep saying, you know, it's, you know, okay, you know, so it's, you know, the agency thing, you know, come on, yeah. you know. And as an agency mean doing what the dog wants to do. So yeah, you can't just say, I do this, this, and this for my dog to provide enrichment. And so their enrichment needs are met when the dog has no desire to do those things, or they might be fine with yeah. them. But, it, but it, it's like, it's, you know, if the dog had a top five, you're yeah. number five and, and 5.3, you know, rather than ever yeah, giving a puzzle, puzzle would maybe be if, if the dog's not anxious and afraid and the public safety is okay. Why can't dogs do what they want to do? What, what's what's the problem there? Yeah, I don't need my dog to be right against me for a mile and a half or a three mile walk. I want my dog to go sniff things. I want them to do it. If I come across a situation where we're about to pass, you know, somebody pulling their kid on a wagon, I'll go, come with me. They'll come with yeah, me. Yeah, why, why is calm, why is calm better? Why is calm better? I mean, just philosophically, why is calm I better. honestly I think it's because fear, it's easier it fear, it's, we lead with it's it just fear of dogs to start with and therefore calm has to be better because it it it, it scares me less yeah and, the, and, and I, then yeah. and then it's all window the rest is all window dressing and I, do I think, think for a lot of people, it is easier. It's easier if your dog sleeps all day. It's easier if your dog is calm. It's easier if you don't have to go out and do something. And I'm not like, this isn't a shaming, like I'm not trying to right. shame no, people. Right. Because I get it. There are times where I'm tired too. Like there's times where, but I do have- Yeah, yeah, yeah. if you breathing. own herding dogs and you're tired, it, there's a problem. <laughs> yeah, but there's you know, it, it would be easier. It's e like Mozzie is um, probably a bad representation of her breed. She would sleep all day and happily snooze away under my desk with very little exercise, very little enrichment, you know, but my other dogs won't. And I, it's, it would be easier if all of them would. So I do think that there is sometimes a driver of just how much time do we have in a day it would be easier for some people if their dogs didn't need exercise and enrichment or movement but, but we're, ad we well, we're adults and we, we can we, we're adults and we can say you know i got this dog that's been bred over 200 generations to be like this and i am tired today and so it is inconvenient and it would be easier if this but then you know but but i you know i i got these herding dogs and so you know, like we can, can't we grow up and say, yeah, you know, so they're, they, they need. Some days are harder need. than others. Yeah. yeah. And this is where like, I wish breeders, that. like. I think, I wonder if, um, though, like we were saying earlier, I think the motivation is different for different people. There are some folks who just like the control over another being, you know, there's that obedience for the sake of obedience. Like and I. are drawn to, a lot of those people are drawn to have versus. Yeah. Under my yeah. control. Um, and look how it, you know does anything I want. And it really is a robot dog. Then there are people who just like, okay, like we were just saying, don't have the bandwidth today. Don't have the time. Don't have the energy. I wish I had a dog that could just lay down and settle when I told it to, um, just because I can't fulfill its needs on this particular day or this particular busy week when, you know, little Johnny's graduating from high school, um, that kind of a thing. And, and then we're a couple other, you know, Christy, you were talking about a couple other different scenarios that might be motivating for people. Um, why they want calm and control, why they want a dog that has an off switch. Um, I think it's different for different populations, uh, for different training camps and for different uh, dog guardians. Um, it's a tough thing, but I think at the end of the day, no matter what people's desire for a dog to just be calm and focused only on us and only behave when we want it to behave and only with the behaviors we feel acceptable, at the end of the day, these are captive animals that we have a responsibility to fulfill the needs of. Um, so not giving them legal outlets for the things that they need to do, it's always gonna come back to that. And Emily, as you always say, if you're not fulfilling their needs, trying to get them to not have any behaviors at all is going to be 10,000 times harder because now you've got a dog that's going out of its mind. <laughs> you and it's unethical. I think like I do, like, I think we should call it what it is. And that like, if we are asking captive animals to, to especially ones who have been bred over, a, you know, a hundred years to be a certain way to not do anything. And then we call it a behavior problem when they do do the happy and excited or the moving or the, whatever it might be. It, it, I do strongly, firmly believe that, that it is unethical. If that's the way, if that, if, if that's our expectations, I think it's that we, it's a huge welfare issue. And I, I, I like, I mean, I, I can see where some people are coming from, I suppose, but I just, again, I think we're going about it in just the wrong, from the wrong side of things. And I think for, for some dog 
guardians, they are ashamed and have been shamed, you know, for having dogs that are being dogs, even though they secretly don't care, don't mind. They're like us. They're, I like watching my dogs play. I find it funny when my dogs play the bitey face game with me, you know, like that, right? I don't care to train my dogs to look in my eyes. <laughs> it's just not my creepy <laughs> after about 10 seconds. But then they, you know, and Emily, I think has been talking about this quite a bit, just like people come to her and they're like, I'm so sorry about my dog. You know, you're the dog professional and I'm so embarrassed. So it's really nice for us as dog professionals to be like, you don't have to be embarrassed. I love that about you. You know, I love yeah. this look on you. I love this look on your family. This is beautiful. Thank you. You made my day. So I think we can give that messaging to our clients. But I think also <clears throat> maybe something that we should be considering as dog trainers is how, what, what scripts can we give them when they're being shamed you know so if they go to the dog park and their dogs are doing xyz what like we need some words to be like well actually i prefer to give my dog agency than <laughs> to have a robot like robot dog is already i think a little bit it has negative sort of connotations it does to me anyway yeah so, but i think you know that'd be something that i'd be interested in hearing about you know how do we give our clients words so that if they're being shamed by their family at the dog park on walks, like on walks and people are like, looks like you're being taken for a walk, like, ah, you know, <laughs> like, to yeah. have something. Yeah, and people sort of say that they, they say in kind of a good natured way, but what they're really doing is your dog is not under control. Yeah, judging. your dog is not exactly. Yeah. That's hard. And people yeah. really most of the time just doing the best they can. So to have all this message, messaging where, normal dog behaviors. Like I said, it's already one of my biggest challenges as a dog trainer is normalizing do normal mm -hmm. dog behavior for owners who not because they think that, you know, just life is hard with, especially with puppies and juveniles and you've, there's a lot to fulfill their needs. Um, so normalizing, yeah, know when your dog gets the zoomies at night and, you know, does parkour off your couch and runs around your, that, that, that is normal. Dogs do that. That's not a dog. That's, you know, it's, not, it's not, it's not a symptom of pathology. Right. And there's so many things that I have to do that with my clients for. So this narrative that we're seeing so much now of calm and focused, calm and engagement. Settled. Yeah. All about engagement is really tough because it was hard enough to normalize that these are, you know, organisms with desires and focus of their own interests of their own. And our job and is all their, their only oh. interest is not us. Dogs are very bonded to us. You know, yeah. um, and when we're when, when after an absence, they're going to be very engaged, you know, the, we're, we're, you know, sort of it's hydraulic, you know, um, and, and they they're but th but that doesn't mean that the, all the time that they, they ha that that we're there. We are their only interest. Right. And it's unfair of us not to fill their needs because it doesn't match with our expectations. So I do think I my biggest concern in all of it is I do seem and again, it's you know, it's, it's my own personal sample size. I do feel like there's an increase in people coming to me saying, you know, I want him to, uh, you know, only focus on me on walks. I oh. want him to, how many times like a foghorn people yell off at their, you know, four month old puppies that put their paws up. It's like, we're going to work on that. We're going to teach polite greetings. We're going to do all those things. This stuff doesn't matter right now. I know you think it does, but it doesn't. It, which, you know, too bad we didn't have like an interest and enrichment protocol instead of a relaxation protocol. Um, you know, yeah. just how do we discover your dog's interests? You know, let's, let's say, you know, if you were going to list them in terms of top five, you know, if you were not exerting control, sniffing, uh, engaging with other dogs, be it play or investigation, um, uh, fetch, uh, what would be your dog's top five? And then really critically ask yourself, why can I not grant those? Yeah. I, I love it. More settled and calm and relaxed after they've been granted. When yeah. 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 Why can't they yeah. have that? Why, why, why do I have to, why do we have to put calm on the list when, if the dog is not, if the dog didn't put calm on the list, why are we putting it? Should have got a calm read or going to get a calm. Yeah. Book. Like, you yeah. know, like I, I sometimes want to say F off to the, you know, the agency people who also want calm. It's like, you know, you're, there's some hypocrisy there that makes me a little bit crazy in case <laughs> I will say for the record too like I have had like you know we've had pit bulls over the years lots of them a Boston Terrier um herding breeds like you name it and none of my dogs have ever been selected for their ability to relax or be calm whether we adopted them as puppies or we got them as older dogs never not once but all we've ever done is exercise enrichment things that they love 
I've never had to train an off switch. I've never had to train a relaxation protocol. Like I printed the relaxation protocol, one of them off one time. And I honestly, I couldn't get through the instructions. I wanted to see what it was like. That's a whole other thing. (laughs) It's like very, um, mind numbing. I'll be honest. Like Mm -hmm. I just couldn't get there. So it's like a cell phone, um, user agreement. (laughs) Yeah. And like at the end of the day, I do have a job to do. I have to sit on calls like this. My dogs, I can't have them barking and jumping in my face all of the time. They are, they do relax and they relax because it follows their needs being met. So again, like I wish I could, this is another one that I would scream from the rooftops. Like we don't, the, the sometimes getting the end result, which is I want dogs that do chill out while I'm working or do chill out while we're trying to watch TV after dinner. I don't want my dogs ripping around all over the couch, all over me, barking at us. You know, How do you we're get trying- there? We get there by meeting their needs in the day. And Griffin now at four o'clock, he will go to his crate, open his door, go in and lie down and put his head on his little pillow and go to sleep (laughs) because he's had what he needs in a day. And I've never had to teach that. I would say he actually the opposite of an off switch. He doesn't have one. He would right now, if I got up, he's coming, he wants, he wants to be engaged and go. So, you know, I just really strongly recommend to people like, I get it. I get that sometimes we need dogs to be quiet and do our, we want to be able to focus in a day. We're not suggesting or advocating for dogs that just run wild all of the time. But if you want to have a dog who is fulfilled, make sure that you meet the needs that they have in exercise and enrichment first. And if it's not coming after that, talk to somebody, perhaps there is something else going on. Maybe there is a reason that needs something that needs to be diagnosed or something. Maybe that it isn't that they just haven't been trained how to lay and be still, you know, in a day and for an entire day. I do think for, for most people, it really is this combination of what are reasonable expectations you know, do they have their energy, you know, their exercise and the age and breed. Yeah. Yep. And then what, you know, what, what do they come to us with? And then what training can we do? Like, so it's a combination of those things, but we have to have reasonable expectations. We have to have better understanding of their needs. We, ha- we can do some training for sure, but fulfill the needs. It's just a tough situation. Um, getting people to, it, 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 yeah. this, it's always person centric. I, I want the dog to do this then and because of this. It's never, what does the dog need? And, I, and it's our responsibility to ask that question first. We're bringing them into our homes. It's it, it, Our responsibility is not to subjugate Bill. Our responsibility is to say, how do we meet their needs? And then that's where everything meets, right? Where the dog's needs are met, helps us to get our needs met out of this relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, but- Their job isn't to feel, to make our, you know, their job isn't to make our lives more convenient. Our job is to make their lives good. Um, That's the thing. I I think it's the, it's it's such a power and balanced relationship that we have with dogs. Yeah. The least we can do is not make them lay still or take them to dog parks where we don't yeah, and lay and label it somehow, you know, somehow better or, or healthier, you know, um, that's why I, labeled it, that I think way. touching on the breed question, if, if someone hasn't got a dog yet and they're looking at dogs and they're attracted to really, really high energy dogs, like, you know, uh, there's, we know the list, all of us. Um, I think that doing a little bit of self-anthropology and being like, why do I want this dog? Why do I want a Malinois? Do I want a Malinois to, so that I can have it and then it will be calm for me because I'm going to be so great and I'm going to make it and then I, I'll, I'll, I'll have some part of my ego met, you know, or, or mm-hmm. I think being realistic about your own ability to meet a dog's needs before you get one of these high energy breeds is very important. If it's all yeah, about and- your ego, you probably like take a few minutes, right? <laughs> Yeah. And this is where I beg, I beg breeders to have conversations with people that are buying their puppies. Like the amount of clients that I've had 
who have a lab or a golden who is really off the charts, you know, they act more like a border collie. <laughs> and I, I say to them, like, where did you, what, did, you know, what did the parent dogs do? You know, were they show dogs? What were, oh, like, what is that? They don't even realize that there was a difference between like a field bred lab or golden and a show line. And I think what they're thinking is that they're going to go and get the couch potato. Like we all know that like dorky lab, that's like, he so sleeps all different. day. So different, but the, that conversation didn't happen with that breeder. Like is mind blowing to me because you, 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 you were selling a living thing that you bred into a home and they thought they were getting you it it's one question you can that get is to so two. criminal you know and, and, and yeah it's been gone it's gone on and on for decades yeah you know the the you know show line golden yeah, versus the the field line golden and people buying the the working line and and then getting a, a comeuppance like wow like so shout out you know to be positive shout out to the jack russell breeders who over the years uh, uh, overwhelmingly my experience has been jack russell people are armed by their breeders with expectations of what what's going to happen and they cheerily and merrily engage their dogs as jack russells you know and, and i wish other breeders could take a page from the jack russell people's book of transparency about what this breed is going to be like yes and also pump your brakes if you're someone like this happens to me a lot where i have clients who they grew up with a border collie or they grew up with a lab or they grew up with a golden and they're like, but I thought that's what I was getting. Mm. Just be aware of the sample, like your sample size. If the sample was one, because I've met them, I've met border collies. I wish I could clone because they are just perfect. Um, but it's, it's the lines. exception to Mwah. the rule, right? So yeah, just be, be careful. And also remember that when you see dogs, like when you see dogs on Instagram, like Griffin, I've put thousands of hours into training this dog, thousands of hours. I put like, you know, I was doing hours a day just during his socialization period alone. And it is it really isn't just, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. So just, you know, if you're going to do it, Again, I would recommend getting an older dog, get a dog who is two years old, three years Senior. old, who, yeah. And like one that you can see like cattle dogs, especially, I will never get a cattle dog puppy as someone who loves them as probably one of my favorite breeds. I will only ever get them who, when they are older and I can adopt them. And I know exactly what I'm getting because I want to make sure I am not getting all of the things that could come, whether I like it or not. So just stack the deck in your favor and just be, be careful if it's because you met that one, if you met that one lab when, you know, or you had a lab growing up, just remember, <clears throat> ask your breeder big questions. What are you getting? Because I I'm telling you right now, I would not want the field bred lab. <laughs> like, and I like a lot of dog, but um, they are, they're just they are a lot, right? So it's, it, it's, um, maybe a miss packaged, um, sales pitch. I don't know what it is, but I really do feel for people who, um, because of failures of breeders um, and, and transparency and trainers and all of us pros who get dogs that they're ill-prepared for, and, you know, I, I feel so bad for those, those people. You I know, should shout out, I should shout out actually also to child breeders. Most child breeders are, are pretty frank about what they're going to get. Um, and child rescues by and large are pretty frank about, you know, the, the typical breed. Any final thoughts? Um, you, um, you know, we've uh, on, you know, the robots, the, the, the agency colliding with the, you know, he needs to be relaxed and why is relaxed better and well, as always, it's so cathartic to sit with you and talk <laughs> with you guys and just, you know, same, I guess just extra more kudos to everyone out there who loves their dogs, being joyful and silly and doggish and slamming into walls and having their own everything. interests. Yeah. And yeah. having their own interests. Yeah. And people who, who look at their dogs doing dog things and not paying attention to them and just love them for it. I mean, like, yeah. shout out to him. I know we're out there. I know there's tons of us. And, yeah, you know, but that, like, like what? You, like, yeah, really like little amateur ethologists watching the dog do the dog stuff. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> 
my favorite things about my dogs are when they have nothing to do with me. I love snuggling with them. I love interacting with them. I love working with them. What I love most is when I see them doing, you know, when I see my little hammy, my little Frenchie, when you open up the, the gate to the backyard and he just shoots out like a bullet and, things. and he wants to explore everything right away. And um, when I see my two pit bulls play with abandon and kind of stand up, I just, I find it fascinating. I find it wonderful. They're enjoying it. I wish them. that, yeah, I wish like more people could just, you know, be infected by Lisa, what she just said and what Christy just said, just, you know, hopefully, hopefully we'll just keep pushing. Yeah. Yeah. Fighting the good fight. Yeah. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.